Hello, my name is Heather McLeod, and I would like to welcome you to today's NSGC Consumer Webinar presentation, Taking Heredity to Heart, the Role of Genetics and Cardiovascular Disease. Next slide. We encourage questions to be asked throughout the presentation. If you have any questions you would like to ask our speakers, Click on the question and answer tab and type a question in the chat box. Questions submitted will be read aloud during the question and answer portion of this presentation. By submitting a question, you are consenting to having the information contained in the question read aloud during the presentation. Please do not submit any personal identifiers in your submission. Please note, as a courtesy to the presenter, all participant telephone lines have been muted automatically. If you should experience technical difficulties during this presentation, please utilize the question and answer tab to submit any questions or concerns our way. Next slide, please. NSGC offers a wide range of educational programming. The information provided in this presentation is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call consultation, or the advice of your physician, genetic counselor, or other healthcare provider. Next slide, please. It is my great pleasure to introduce Amy Sturm as our speaker for this webinar. Amy is the Director of Cardiovascular Genomic Counseling at the Geisinger Health System Genomic Medicine Institute. She has over 13 years of experience as a cardiovascular genetic counselor. She was co-founder and one of two first co-chairs of NSGC's Cardiovascular Genetic Special Interest Group. Amy has authored multiple cardiovascular genetics publications. She also serves on the Medical Education and Research Committees of the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome Foundation, and also works closely with the Familial Hypercholesterolemia Foundation. She is a wonderful resource to both her patients and colleagues. It is my great pleasure to introduce Amy, and I will hand the presentation over to you. And I'm just going to go back a couple slides and make sure that we all get to know Heather McLeod, our moderator tonight as well. Heather is a wonderful colleague of mine in the field of cardiovascular genetics, has been practicing um, for many years and graduated from the Northwestern Genetic Counseling Program in 2001 and is really um, a national leader in the field of cardiovascular genetics actively involved in all of the different genetic counseling organizations, including the American Board of Genetic Counseling and this organization, the NSGC, and also works very closely in addition with the SAD Foundation. And currently, she has a role as the Senior Project Manager for the Data Coordinating Center for the Sudden Death in the Young Case Registry. So that's who our co-moderator is tonight, and we're excited to kick this off. So just going to go back up to our title slide again and say thanks everybody for joining us tonight um, on this very last day of Heart Month, uh, February. We always celebrate why it's important to know about heredity and heart disease. Um, and so we're going to jump right in and hopefully give you a lot of great information tonight that you can use to keep your heart healthy. So. You know, why is this so important and why did the National Society of Genetic Counselors choose to focus on heart disease for a webinar to bring to all of you out there? Well, you know, the, the number one reason is really because heart disease is the number one cause of death of both men and women. And this is a fact and this is something that we need to get our little red megaphone pictured here and spread awareness. Um, about this fact and, and knowing that heart disease um, is something that really everyone needs to think about and know about. Yet, on the other hand, so much of heart disease can be preventable. And that's really, you know, the information that we want to make sure that all of you gain this evening with us. 
The other reason it's really important to take heredity to heart specifically is that these conditions really, when you look at all of them collectively, they're not really that rare or uncommon. And when we look at all of the cardiogenetic conditions, more than one in every 100 people could have a genetic predisposition that is leading them to be at higher risk for a hereditary type of heart disease. And, you know, one way I kind of think about this is if you think about all of your Facebook friends or all of the, you know, people in your neighborhood or people you know through your kids' schools or everyone you went to high school with, you likely know not just one, but probably multiple people that have a hereditary risk for heart disease, whether it be somebody in your family or a neighbor or a friend. And so, you know, once you gain this information, maybe it affects you directly and maybe it would be something that you can help share with other people too. So we'll start off with a little biology 101 uh, slide to get everyone kind of using that same language when we talk about genetics. And you know, what I'm gonna focus in on here is the fact that in every single one of the billions of cells that make up each and every one of our bodies, we have DNA. We have the DNA code that makes every one of us a unique individual, a unique human being. And this DNA code is raveled up in these structures called chromosomes. And we basically inherit these chromosomes from our mom and from our dad at the point of conception and the egg and the sperm. And the chromosomes, again, are made up of that DNA code. And pieces of the DNA are called genes. And these are kind of those single units of heredity and genes can code for your traits, things like what color hair you have or how tall you are. And they also, when they have a change or a misspelling that can be called a variation or a mutation, can actually predispose to different types of diseases, including heart diseases. And the reason that is, is because of this DNA code that you see here in this DNA alphabet isn't the right spelling that it should be it can make this protein not be made the right way it should. And essentially the proteins are what do all the different jobs in every single organ of our body, including the heart. And you know, something that's important to understand and know is that you know, none of us are perfect, even though we might think we are, um, but we all have genetic predispositions and everyone carries different DNA changes in their genetic makeup and in their DNA code. And the thing is, they might not always lead to a disease. And there are things that we can do to, if we know about these genetic predispositions, actually prevent or postpone um, or reduce that risk. And here I just like to show actually on some of the chromosomes, some of the different markers that actually are tied across the different um, chromosomes you might see that can cause some of the heart diseases I'll be talking about tonight. So next, I have to dig in and share with you a little bit more detail on the heart and why the heart is just such an amazing organ and an important organ in our body. You can see here this beautiful picture in the middle of the heart and all the vessels that carry the blood to the heart. And on either side, you can kind of see how the heart is situated right there in your upper chest cavity between your lugs. Again, carrying all of that blood to um, everywhere from your brain down to your toes. And the heart really, again, it's an amazing organ. And I kind of like to break it down into the different functions it have and, and use some analogies to make it simple to understand. So basically, the heart is actually a pump. It has plumbing and it has electricity. So you can kind of, you know, make that connection to something we all understand in our homes. And, you know, we'll start off by talking a little bit more about how the heart is a pump. And something that most people may not know is that the heart is actually a muscle. Just like your biceps or your quads, if you like to work out, your heart works out a lot. The heart is the hardest working muscle in the entire human body, which is really quite amazing. And the heart is very important for that strong heart muscle to pump thousands of times a day 
to get all of that blood with every single beat of your heart pumped out to the rest of the body. And what we know is the heart can get sick and the heart can develop disease. And there are different types of heart disease, of course, but one of the major types is where the heart muscle itself just isn't working the right way it should. And there are many different things that this can lead to, it getting too big, not strong enough. And we have different uh, words for this, but the main term is called cardiomyopathy. And really what that means, if you break the word down, is just heart, cardio, myo, which means muscle, and the pathy means disease. And so there are different types. And you know, you can kind of see right here, here's a, here's a diagram of the heart and just showing um, the heart muscle on the outside and how normally it would pump this red blood out of that left ventricle, the really hard pumping part of the um, heart to the rest of the body. But this can, again, like I said, you know, get sick. And a lot of the reasons it can is due to genetic predispositions. And so if you compare the normal heart right here to this heart, which we call a dilated cardiomyopathy, and you can see just visually, it's too big, the walls aren't thin and, and very muscular anymore. And then here you see a condition where we call that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is really when the heart gets too thickened. Um, and you can see that this uh, leads the heart to really not be able to function the right way. Sometimes it can even block off this cavity altogether or severely restrict the blood ability to come out of the heart. And then also with restrictive cardiomyopathy, the heart just can't relax as well and fill up with blood and repump out the blood again. So there, there are many different ways this heart muscle or this pump can be affected. Now the heart also, like I said, has plumbing. And so if you look at this picture of the heart, you can kind of see these tubes, which are blood vessels on the top of the heart structure. And the plumbing of the heart is really important for carrying all of that great blood with all of the oxygen and nutrients our body needs to the heart itself. And if we get blockages in these arteries, which we call the coronary arteries, this is what causes the most common type of heart disease called coronary artery disease. And then these blockages can lead to something that most people have heard about called a heart attack. And this is when if that bloodstream is cut off and can't get to the muscle, that part of the muscle can be very severely affected, can't work the right way it should, and you have a, a sudden heart attack. Now, the heart also has other plumbing that it works with throughout the entire rest of the body, our arteries and our veins. And when we have problems with some of the arteries, including the major artery in our body called the aorta, which carries blood, again, outward of the heart, up to the brain, and then down to the rest of the body, the abdomen, and the lower part of the body, we know that that can be susceptible to disease as well. And a bulging of the blood vessels you can see here is what we call an aneurysm. And most of you have probably heard of an aneurysm, and that's actually a bulging in that vessel that makes it weakened. This can be due to stress on the vessel, due to things like high blood pressure or smoking or getting older, but you guessed it, it can also be due to genetics in our family tree. Now the heart, lastly, has a whole electrical system. Just like you think about the electricity in your heart, we have a whole wiring system in our heart that is very intricate. And there is a natural pacemaker in the heart located right up here in the top portion of the heart and it is responsible for sending electrical signals throughout the heart to make sure that the heart beats very steady. So not too fast and not too slow. And that it just has a very, very steady rhythm to make sure that we have the regular um, beating of the heart and contraction of the heart muscles. And any problem with this entire process is what happens when a person has an arrhythmia or that abnormal heartbeat disease. Now, pretty much any one of these conditions that I've mentioned so far can be heredity or hereditary and can be due to changes in our DNA code or things we see in our family history. So really this entire list and then in addition some others like birth defects 
defects in infants called congenital heart defects, and then some of even the conditions that might predispose us to heart disease, like high cholesterol. And there is a common condition called familial hypercholesterolemia that affects about one in 250 people. So something very important to know about and be aware of. So we'll move on to our next topic, and that is that of the family tree. Or another um, word that we use for it in the world of genetics is the pedigree. So why is this important and why is this, you know, something we need to talk about? And really, we need to talk about this in pretty much almost every genetics talk because the family history is extremely powerful for all of us genetic counselors and other healthcare providers who work with you to understand what type of genetic risks you might have. And it's really, you know, a picture into the past that can hopefully help us present things, prevent things in the future. And, you know, when we look in your family history, we might see some people may be predisposed to heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes or cancer. It can give us a lot of information about most all of the common diseases that have a genetic component. And it, it tells us even more than just the shared DNA that you might have with your mom or your dad or your siblings. You know, it also, it's really interesting because it helps tell us about your shared environment. You know, you grew up in the same house. Well, what was that household like? What was the diet like that you grew up having? You know, was smoking in the house? Was it not? Common behaviors people might have, exercise that families might have in common or not. So it can give us a lot of shared information. And, you know, the bottom line is knowing this type of information can actually save your life. So I wanted to show you all what the pedigree or family tree looks like, and I'll show you a few of these tonight. But what we do in the genetics clinic um, is that we work with you to collect all of this information. And we always try to get at least three generations of family tree information. And we use symbols to help code everything so we know what they mean, and we explain this to you as we go along. And we use circles to represent women, and squares to represent men and boys. And you can see here that if we're looking at this patient, this would be a 15-year-old boy, and we draw his mother's entire side of the family, his father's entire side of the family. And what we collect really is, is all the medical information on all the individuals. You know, how old are they? What conditions do they have? Did they pass away? And if so, what did they die from? And what age were they? Because this is all the type of information that can be so helpful to us when we try to assess what might your risk be. So this is something that's really great for us to be able to use for you. So next, I'd like to just share a little bit of information about inheritance and how genetic conditions can be passed down through families. And so the reason I wanted to share this information, um, and we'll start with something called autosomal dominant inheritance, is that most of the main heart conditions that we see are inherited in this way. And so here you see an example family tree again. And another coding system we use is we, is we denote people who might have the condition or might not have the condition in a family. And this is something that very easily helps us see that pattern in a family. And what we know with the autosomal dominant inheritance is it means that it can affect boys, girls, men, and women. It can affect both sexes equally. And we also know that first-degree relatives, and what I mean by that is parents, brothers and sisters, and children. So all of your close, what we call first-degree relatives, have a 50-50 chance to also have a genetic predisposition if you have one. Now, the genetic predisposition does not skip generations. If it goes to a person, there is a chance for it to go on to the next person. But the condition itself may not be in every single generation of the family, and I'll explain a little bit more of that now. So a few additional rules of thumb when you think about genetics and heart disease and how these conditions work is that most hereditary cardiovascular conditions are relatively common conditions. You know, the things we've already talked about tonight, like heart attacks or aneurysms or arrhythmias, but we might see them at very younger ages of onset, and they can oftentimes be much more severe and cause very tragic outcomes, even things like sudden death in families. 
Now, again, most of these conditions are that autosomal dominant chance I talked about where it's 50-50 chance and you can inherit this from mom or dad and pass it on to your children, no matter what, you know, if they're a boy or a girl. But when you look at your own family tree, if you have one of these conditions, it may not always appear to be as striking of every generation with multiple people affected. Well, well, why is that? And the reason is, again, and you know, you're going to hear me say this a few times tonight, but genetic risk is not a definite destiny, okay? Genetics gives us information about our increased risks, but it doesn't mean we are definitely destined to develop a condition. And so you may not see everyone in the family who has a genetic predisposition ending up with that type of heart disease. We also see smaller families where we just don't see, you know, as many people in a family, so there aren't as many people to develop the condition. And another thing is that people can present differently with these conditions. There may be very mild signs of a condition, something even as basic as some very kind of, you know, symptoms that may not be that striking, maybe even some things like passing out that could be a sign that the heart isn't beating the right way that it should be. And I'll talk about that when we get into a few more examples. But the conditions do present variably from one person to the next. And within that, they can affect people in the same family who even have the same exact genetic predisposition at different ages. So there's a lot to think about when we look at our family tree and try to figure out that information. So I wanted to show you an example of, of what a family tree might look like on a patient who comes in to the cardiogenetics clinic. And this is a woman here who's 46 years old, and she has a pretty striking history. She had a heart attack at a young age, and you know when you look at her family tree, she has several siblings um, who have coronary artery disease or who have died of a heart attack. Um, and you can see that this even goes backwards into the previous generations of her family. And, you know, one thing that I think would be so important to think about in a situation like this is the fact that you can see here this woman has three children of her own who are in their teens to their 20s. And then in addition, she has three grandchildren. And she also has nieces and nephews. And, you know, one of the most important things, again, about cardiac genetics is that I've heard from a lot of patients of mine over the years that they think, you know, well, this, this is just how it is in my family. Everybody gets heart disease. And, you know, one of the main things I want you to know tonight is that it doesn't have to be that way. If we see a family like this, what we can do for the younger generations with our current knowledge and what we have available to us with the other healthcare providers we work with, from cardiologists to primary care physicians to pharmacists to nurses, we have tools that we can equip you with to literally keep these types of diseases from going on and causing problems in people in future generations, even if they have the genetic predisposition. So there's something else that's really important that I share with you about inheritance and how some of these conditions work in families. And I want to introduce you to a concept called multifactorial or complex inheritance. And it's complex because this means there are multiple different components that feed into why a person might ultimately get the condition. So we know that really the combination of our chance to get a common disease like coronary artery disease, that condition I was talking about earlier where there's blockages in the coronary arteries, is based on a lot of different factors. It's based on environmental factors. So of course we have things that can be protective, like having a healthy diet and exercising and not smoking. We also have environmental risk factors, which would be the flip side of that. Smoking, you know, having an unhealthy diet, having conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes. On that same token, there are not only genetic risk factors, but there are also genetic protective factors that can run in families. And sometimes you may look at a family tree and see that in your entire family, Maybe there's absolutely no heart disease or no cancer or, or, you know, maybe no diabetes. And that might mean that your family has protective factors against that condition. But when we put all of this together, we can kind of get a sense as to what a person's ultimate or lifetime chance to get a disease 
might be that has this complex type of inheritance. And so if you have really, you know, a pretty negative family history and you have a very healthy lifestyle and environment, you'll likely have a low risk for disease or an average risk for disease. If you have some genetic risk factors, but you know, you're, you're very healthy and you live a very healthy lifestyle, you can actually reduce your risk. Now, if you have genetic risk factors and a strong family history, and then on top of it, there are things like smoking or unhealthy diet and unhealthy lifestyle, that can even exacerbate or make that risk worse and end up giving a person really quite an increased risk for disease. And so again, this is how um, all of these different risk factors play a role coming together for, again, that most common type of heart disease that we see out there in the general public and in our family trees, coronary artery disease. And, you know, when you look at um, this picture here, building up the heart, these are all the different risk factors that we hear about a lot. But I just want to emphasize again to all of you that family history is one of those major risks. And even when we take away all of the others, family history remains an independent, important risk factor for coronary artery disease. So I wanted to show you a few different family trees broken down into kind of average or typical risk, moderate or slightly increased risk, and then high or elevated increased risk for heart disease. And this is again when I'm talking about that common type of heart disease, that coronary artery disease, the blockages, the, art, you know, the arteries that are blocked and leading to heart attacks. And I think you can just very visually easily see the difference between these family trees. Where, you know, this woman here, she has one, what we call second degree relative. This would be her maternal grandmother who had coronary artery disease at an older age. But, you know, her risk might be bumped up some if she has an additional relative, her maternal uncle with coronary artery disease in his 60s. And then when you look at this family tree here, you can see why this might be in that high risk category. Because now we have a, a woman, a patient who comes in, and she has a brother who has coronary artery disease at a young age, in his 40s. And not only that, you can see that then these other relatives are at young age as well, and then related conditions such as stroke and diabetes too. So this would be the type of family history that if you look you know, into this family history and you see this type of risk, you might have a risk for that very common type of heart disease, heart attack, coronary artery disease, the blockages, and something very important to raise awareness with for your healthcare provider. So now I'd like to launch into a portion of the talk that I named Keys to Your Genetic Heart Health. And I'm gonna give you top five keys that I want you to take away with you tonight. And so jumping into number one, I've already talked about some of these, but I want to, you know, make sure we focus on these. But there are some red flags that everyone should be aware of for hereditary heart disease, and you can be on the watch for these in your own personal history and in your family history. So here's a list. It's something you can keep. I also have a couple blog posts out there on the National Society of Genetic Counselors website that lists all of these for you to come back to and reference in the future. Um, but, you know, off the top, the number one red flag that everyone should know is young age of onset. Heart disease just should not happen in a person of younger ages. And so if you see this in your family or your personal history, there could indeed be a genetic risk. And so a heart attack under 55 years of age or a heart attack under 65 years of age, some of you may have even heard in the news um, that... Bob Harper from The Biggest Loser had a heart attack, he disclosed recently, and we're happy to hear he's on the mend and doing well, but he was 51 when this happened, and especially with just how very healthy he is, you know, it, it could be that genetics may have played a role. And so again, young age of onset, so very important to make sure that you really pay attention to that when you're looking at your potential risk. Now, something else that um, we can see in families with almost all of the hereditary cardiac conditions is something we call sudden death or sudden cardiac arrest. And this is when the heart stops beating and it stops beating suddenly 
and it can lead to a person having an arrest where they might receive CPR or a, an additional type of life-saving technique and they survive. Um, but tragically, what some of these families deal with, with the conditions we work with in the cardiogenetics clinic is sudden death. And so if you have a family history of sudden death, especially in a younger person, this indeed could be a red flag that there could be a genetic condition at hand. Another thing we see is heart failure. And heart failure is common. But when we see heart failure in a younger person, that especially um, raises a red flag to us. And then we have a list of other things, like individuals who have to undergo heart transplant. That might be due to one of those cardiomyopathy conditions. Not being able to tolerate exercise, having something called syncope, or more commonly known as fainting. Multiple family members who had to get a cardiac device implanted to make their heart beat the right way or shock it back into normal rhythm. Pacemakers, defibrillators. Also, if you have a lot of relatives who have had to have surgeries or procedures like bypass surgery, stents placed in the arteries to keep them open. And finally, there are some conditions that can be related, like the high cholesterol condition. And also, you may not make this obvious connection, but what we've learned through research is that conditions like sudden infant death syndrome and even seizures can be tied to some of the hereditary arrhythmias we work with. So let's go into key number two. What we also know is that many of these types of hereditary heart disease are preventable. And so this is you know, something that we just want to make sure all of you know and that we equip you with you, this knowledge. Because again, you know, even if these diseases are running in the family, we can really bring down the risk very substantially, even by things like taking a daily medication or making sure that you go check in with a cardiologist every year or every few years to make sure that you don't have early signs of the heart disease running in your family. So we definitely have ways that we work with the healthcare provider team to make sure that if there is a hereditary risk, we know about it, your healthcare provider knows about it, and does everything possible we can to get you on the treatment plan that you need. Key number three is that early detection and diagnosis is key. And this is because many of these heart conditions that are genetic, they can affect kids. And they can affect the younger generations in our families. And so if we know about this, the earlier we can find out in kids, in teenagers, in our family, it's just so important because it gives us the best shot, you know, the best chance of preventing some of these complications I've talked about including those sudden cardiac arrests. So key number four is that finding the genetic cause of heart disease in a family makes it possible for every person in that family who wants to find out, including children, so parents of children, to find out did they inherit this risk or did they not? And so that's key number four. And really, you know, the main tool we use to help us figure this out is genetic testing. And so I'd like to now talk to you for a few minutes about genetic testing for heart disease. So this is um, information from a website called genetests.org. And you can see that over the course of time, um, genetic testing has just exponentially increased as far as what we have available for our patients and for individuals who want to find out um, if genetic testing might be right for them. And currently in 2017, there are over 5,000 conditions that we have genetic testing for. And many of these relate to heart disease or to different conditions that have heart disease as part of the spectrum. So there's different types of genetic testing and different tools or uses of genetic testing. You know, one of the initial types of genetic testing is for a person who is affected and has one of these heart conditions themselves. And by them undergoing genetic testing, they can confirm whether or not the condition they have might be genetic. And that can officially diagnose them with a genetic condition. And that also gives them information about the inheritance of the condition and how that may affect them and their family. 
And then we have something called predictive or pre-symptomatic testing. And that's when we find an answer in a family. We can actually bring that tool to every single at-risk person in the family and again, predict and find out, did they inherit that risk factor or did they not? Now, one of the main things about genetic testing is that when at all possible, genetic testing should start in a person who actually has the condition in the family. And this is so very important because for us to have the best chance of figuring out what's going on in a family, we want to test somebody who actually has the condition because we would expect that, of course, they have the genetic mutation or variation leading them to have that disease. So if we're going to find it, it's going to be in the person who has the disease. Something else that's important to know is that even up to 10% of the time, if not maybe with some conditions, more we're learning with new genetic technologies, some individuals with hereditary types of heart disease have more than one mutation playing a role. And so we want to make sure we do that most comprehensive test in someone who is presented in the family you know, even the youngest or with the most severe presentation, but that definitely has a diagnosis because that's where we're going to get our most useful information. And then, again, we can take, if we find a specific genetic change, we take that, we can test everyone in the family for it, and that test is usually very um, affordable and more inexpensive on the order of a couple hundred dollars. And prices just keep going more and more down so that more and more patients can access this really important and useful test. And once again, just what we have available for our patients and you know, with our technology today continues to amaze me. Um, and over the course of the past 15 years that I've been working as a genetic counselor, uh, we just keep seeing more and more amazing advancements. And I know that the future will probably just continue to hold more that we can do for patients with these amazing technologies. Um, but we have basically tests where we can test for specific conditions, specific types of arrhythmias or heart muscle diseases, or things like the familial hypercholesterolemia condition with what we call these disease-specific panels. But we also have a lot of flexibility when we're ordering genetic testing to customize a test to what your presentation looks like or what your family looks like. And we have um, very large testing capabilities, if we think that might be the best option for you, including if we've kind of, you know, looked at some of the main genetic tests and we haven't found an answer, we can even go up and escalate that to something called whole exome sequencing, where we're literally looking at the about 20,000 total genes um, in the entire human genome that make a protein in the body. So we might find an answer that way. And it, it's actually on the forefront and available now for whole genome sequencing. And most of us in the field of genetics and genomics think that this is going to just continue to be exploding and growing as the future goes on. Now, you know, there's a balanced view that we have to look at all of this new technology and what we have available to us. And, and I hope that you've seen um, by what I've shared with you a lot of the benefits of genetic testing. You know, finding out why you might have a condition, finding out for your family, it sometimes, you know, even improve disease management or risk management or knowing exactly what type of treatment might work best. Also, like we've talked about, information for the family, information for children in these families with hereditary heart conditions, and it can also help with certain lifestyle decision making. It's important, too, to know that there are some limitations. Sometimes, especially when we're looking at a lot of genomic information, you might have the chance to get an uncertain result, a result that maybe has never even been seen in another patient before besides you. And so interpreting that type of result can be tricky, and we might not have the exact answer right now. And that's really why it's important to even have follow-up genetic counseling and potentially even testing over time, because it's always important to come back and find out, you know, has there been any new information learned about what may have come back on my genetic testing? And again, it's important to remember these results, they don't indicate definite destiny. They indicate a probability, a risk. And so it's really important to have that conversation too. 
And finally, there are some people, you know, where we have potential concerns about genetic discrimination still, especially in the area of life insurance, because we do have federal laws and protections against genetic discrimination, especially in the space of health insurance and employer discrimination. But life insurance is, is an outlier where we don't. And so it's important to understand that too. So I always like to talk about a family when I'm sharing all of this information. Um, and I'll share with you right now a family that I worked with. And this is a little boy that unfortunately I never had the pleasure of meeting. But he was the son of a woman that I worked with and um, the brother to these two girls, her daughters. This little youngster had a condition that we know as long QT syndrome. And long QT syndrome is one of the more common hereditary arrhythmia conditions that we work with and, and that most cardiac genetic counselors have seen multiple families with. And it can be diagnosed by findings on electrocardiogram but the electrocardiogram might not always give you the exact answer you need. Um, it can present with passing out or fainting spells. Again, what we call a syncope is the medical term. And it can also, in the worst and most tragic scenario, result in sudden cardiac death. This is what happened to the young boy I showed and in his family. And we do know that there are some other um, markers in the family tree that, that might be connected or that how the condition might present. Um, sudden infant death syndrome has been shown to be caused by variations in the same genes that cause long QT syndrome. Genetic testing is available for this condition and it's quite strong. It can find the answer in the majority of families and patients. And again, once we find an answer in the family, we can use that test for everyone at risk. And this is one of those conditions that is highly treatable, even with medication, and for patients that have kind of more severe forms, they might require implantation of something called a defibrillator to make sure that heart is in the normal rhythm or gets shocked back into the normal rhythm it needs. This is the family tree I took for this patient, and you can see here uh, when I met her, um, she again had two daughters in her 20s and her son had passed away when he was eight. Now, this family had been kind of going and getting screening for years, getting electrocardiograms, and some people weren't really sure did they have the disease or not. Some people may have had some of the features like passing out, but you know, there's multiple reasons you could pass out. You could pass out when you get your blood drawn because you don't like to fight a needles. So not everything, you know, passing out is due to a hereditary heart disease. And that's what this family was really trying to figure out and, and actually trying to figure out for the next generation. And so I worked with this woman many years after her son had passed away to coordinate genetic testing. And her genetic testing indeed did find an answer. And she tested positive for a genetic variation in the, in the main long QT syndrome gene. And then we tested her father and she had actually inherited that from him. And he had remember as a young boy running through the fields of his family farm and passing out actually when he was young. And he just, he never knew what that was or what that was due to. When he was a young boy, this condition had not really even been described yet. Um, and we were able to go through and test every single member of this family and find out did they or did they not inherit the condition. And what was so wonderful for this mom and for her daughters to find out was that neither one of them had actually inherited this risk. And that was a huge weight off their shoulders, especially for the one that already had a little boy herself. We went through and did genetic testing for the entire rest of the family. And you can see, you know, some tested positive, some tested negative. And the value of this information for this family was really important, you know, confirming what was going on, finding out for her daughters, for her girls, and for her grandson that luckily they actually hadn't inherited this risk. Actually, we also figured out that this was long QT type one, which we know is very responsive to treatment with a medication called a beta blocker. And so for those who tested positive, we made sure that they were hooked up with all the cardiology care they needed. And for those who tested negative, 
they really, you know, had this relief that they didn't have that risk and neither would their children. Because when a person hasn't inherited a genetic predisposition, it can't be passed on. Key five, I just wanted to share with you that as a genetic counselor, want you all to know that we are here to work with you to understand all of this um, and how it relates to you and your family. And, um, you know, again, you can go to the NSGC website to learn more about cardiovascular genetic counselors and other genetic counselors. This is a patient who actually shared his story, um, kind of going through this whole process. Uh, his brother had actually died suddenly, and we were able to coordinate something called post-mortem genetic testing on a blood sample that had luckily been saved from his brother after he passed away that got to the bottom of what was going on in this family. I highly, you know, recommend you going ahead and visiting the NSGC patient-facing website about geneticcounselors.com. It's chock full of great information for all of you. You know, how do you find one of us and, and how can you talk to us? How can a genetic counselor help me, which I hope you've learned about tonight? And, you know, even the basics, like how much does this cost? Will my health insurance cover it? It's all right there for you on aboutgeneticcounselors.com. So in sum, you know, I hope you can see the value of the cardiovascular genetics, how we help to confirm the diagnosis, give you information on how it's inherited, all the information for how it can help you be screened and prevent these diseases. And also, like you saw in the family example, just, you know, how this can really empower people to have knowledge and how it can also give those relief who, who haven't inherited risk. And so I want to equip you to be able to, you know, really take this information, turn it into a next step, into action. You know, we can't change our DNA code or our family history, um, but what you can do is have this knowledge. You can look for those red flags that I talked about. And, you know, when you find out that you have this risk, share it. Tell your family. Make sure everyone has the information they need to keep heart healthy. And I hope that we've giving you all the keys to your genetic heart health tonight. Thanks for joining Heather and I and excited to take any questions that might be out there now. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. Such great keys to both helping prevent heart disease in ourselves and in our families um, and working to reduce our risk. We've had a couple of really great questions come in while you were giving your presentation. Um, I will start with, um, how do you decide who is the most informative family member when starting a pedigree? That's a great question. So, you know, people come into the genetics clinic from all different perspectives. One might be a person who is referred in by their cardiologist, and they might have the condition themselves, and their cardiologist is referring to genetics to say, you know, this patient, they have a condition at a young age, or, or it's a specific condition that they know is likely genetic, and that could be definitely the very most informative person in the pedigree, because they are affected, and they have the condition. But when I take the big three or four generation pedigree and I look across the entire family tree, um, you know, if I see someone and maybe my patient, say, is in their 40s or 50s or older with a, with a genetic condition that looks to be a cardiovascular genetic disease, um, but say they have a relative who's diagnosed at a very young age, maybe even in their teens or younger. I might even say that's the most informative person because, again, that person presenting at such a young, striking age, we likely have the best chance to find all of the genetic risk factors that are important in that family in that individual. So, you know, there's different genetic testing strategies that we can often uh, discuss with our patients, and that's where genetic counseling can come in and really build that whole entire family tree and figure out who's the most informative. But off, oftentimes it is the person that's been affected at the youngest age. Great. Um, let me ask you one follow-up question on that. Um, if you test the most informative or youngest person in a family, 
and the genetic testing done does not find a pathogenic result, a mutation, um, is it worth other family members getting genetic testing done? So if um, a person who has a condition undergoes genetic testing and it's negative, you know, sometimes it can be, and there are a few reasons why. Um, not all genetic tests are created equal, first of all. So it would be important to see where did that first person have their genetic testing done? You know, did it include all the technologies that we know are important to be able to find all, all different kinds of mutations? Also, how long ago was that genetic test done? Because as you saw, genetic testing just continues to explode, continues to improve. Our technology is getting better and better. We literally are discovering new genes associated with heart disease every month, every year. So our knowledge is getting better and better. And so if a person in a family has had negative genetic testing before, you know, I would always, as the genetic counselor, want to get a copy of that report, evaluate it, see if I thought it was up to par with the current genetic testing that's top notch out there available for us to order today. And if it wasn't, it very well could be very helpful to test another family member. And sometimes um, people in the family, they might have a condition, uh, but it may not be the exact related disease that's in the family member. So there could be, in addition to just, hey, might not have been the most up-to-date genetic test, it could be that we are seeing two unrelated things even in the same family. That can happen. Um, so there could be reasons to test other family members, yes. Great. Sounds uh, very important to talk with an expert about going through this process. Um, let me ask you another question that has come in. What sort of genetic tests might you recommend for someone from a closed adoption who wants to know a broad scope of their genetic history? You know, that's a great question, and it's one I get all the time. And, you know, I think there are different options for individuals who are adopted and who have absolutely no information about their family history. Um, the problem with doing some genetic testing on individuals who are adopted is oftentimes we need to um, basically interpret genetic variation in context. And context is oftentimes family history. Um, but I wouldn't say that that would preclude me from having a conversation and pre-test genetic counseling with an individual who's adopted to really talk through all the options. And there are genetic counselors out there who specialize in just that, who, who might even work in private practice and who um, accept clients from all different types of backgrounds where they don't have any family history that they have available. And I would be happy to connect you, you know, with, with one of those types of genetic counselors who's really an expert in that type of genetic testing for adoptees. You could also potentially find that type of information on find a genetic counselor, um, but definitely happy to provide that type of information for anyone who's interested. Great. Um, on a similar thought process, um, we had a question come in where someone was born with a congenital heart defect. Um, it was our um, question asker's father. Um, and he went on, he had it repaired and went on to suffer irregular heart rhythm. Um, it has a pacemaker, but the family is no longer in contact with him. Um, what kind of options are available to a person in this situation where their family member is not willing to share information with them or they're not in contact with that person anymore? Yeah. That's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, something that is really important is that if we can find out the exact name of the condition um, that the person's family member might have. So maybe through medical records, um, if they would be willing to share that, um, or, you know, maybe if they're not on the best terms or the best relationship, uh, sometimes they might still be able to just be willing to share the name of their condition. 
um, and why that is important to their children or their grandchildren. Um, you know, congenital heart defects are very common. They affect about one in every 100 baby born. Not all of them have a strong genetic cause, so that's something important to know. Um, you know, if you aren't able to get any information from your father with the heart defect at all, I would recommend talking to your healthcare provider about the fact that your father had a heart defect. I would also recommend trying to get as much additional family history that you can and see, you know, was he the only one with a heart defect or was there any other stronger family history or additional family history of heart disease? That'll help give you maybe some extra information. And then I would recommend again, like I said, circle back with your healthcare provider. They can listen to your heart on physical examination. They can talk to you about whether there might be any screening that would be recommended for you. Sometimes an imaging test of the heart, like an echocardiogram, can easily see if the heart structure is normal or not. And so I would definitely bring that information to your healthcare provider and have a conversation, as well as try to seek out a little bit more information. Um, but again, heart defects are common and they're not always genetic, just to be somewhat reassuring. Great. Um, let's do one more question before the hour wraps up. Um, what if your family does not talk much about their family history um, and you don't feel like you know what is inherited in your family? What are some good times or ways to bring up that conversation with your family? Sure. You know, over the years, I've, I've had so many families say to me um, when they finally make it into the genetics clinic, you know, some people come in right away when they're diagnosed. Some people know they might have a risk, um, but they're kind of putting it off. But one thing that I have to say I've heard more than any other is that a real motivator for people has been their children and their grandchildren um, in sharing this information. I also hope that with how much technology we have available at our fingertips, just like us bringing you know, this webinar to all of you from the comfort of our homes tonight, that via things like email, texting, Facebook, that hopefully it will be easier for families to share. I know I had a young patient um, you know, in her 20s, a college student, and she had a family history, but all of her relatives were overseas. But she, through Facebook, was able to get information about her grandfather's diagnosis. And it was really powerful and, and gave us great information. And so, you know, with email, again, and social media and Facebook and different ways we can all communicate, I hope that this type of technology might make it a little bit easier um, for family to share. And there are also tools that we as genetic counselors are developing for families to be able to share this information more actively. Um, you know, holidays, it's always brought up. Thanksgiving is actually National Family History Day, and I know not most of us are kind of having this on top of the brain while we're sitting down to eat our turkey and mashed potatoes, but, you know, a lot of us, we don't see our families that often, and families are splintered across the country, if not the world. So you really sometimes have to think outside the box as to how to best get this information, um, but holidays can be a great way, and the one last thing I'll say is that there's usually one person in the family. I know for me, it's my one aunt. And she has all the information on all the extended family members. And so if you kind of know, hey, there's this one major person, she loves to be the historian, she has the whole genealogy, you know, maybe she's really into Ancestry.com or other great family tools like that. Sometimes they can, can help you too or might even have some of that information already or have started putting it together. So this would be some tips. Great. Well, thank you so much, Amy. You shared such useful information tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone that has called in. This has been really a fantastic webinar. Um, and with that, we will say good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>